Imagine yourself sitting in a large lecture hall. You're trying your best to concentrate, but your mind is elsewhere. Twitter, BuzzFeed, Candy Crush, Flappy Birds, all seem so much more interesting than the words coming out of the professor's mouth. And they're all available on the iPhone in your pocket, which is now buzzing. Oh, you just have a Snapchat from one of your classmates. They're sending you a picture of the kid in the third row who's sleeping. And it's titled, This Lecture is Boring. We have many distractions in our life. One of the distractions that I couldn't resist when I was a student was The Mailbag by Bill Simmons. Simmons writes for ESPN, and every Friday afternoon, he would write a column featuring emails from his actual readers, and I was hooked. He'd feature emails like this one from Brian from Brockport, New York, and I'll highlight a bit of it. I always read Grantland on my phone while pooping, and my leg always ends up falling asleep. I just read Bill Simmons' column, and now I can't walk, he tells his girlfriend. Simmons will give his stamp of approval to emails like this by saying, yep, these are my readers. How can I captivate the attention of my students, just like Bill Simmons does in his column? Learning is so much more than a transfer of information. Learning is about content, curiosity, and relationships. And Bill Simmons does such a great job by weaving these three aspects together in his column. Mark Twain was once credited as saying that college is a transfer of the professor's notes to the student's notes without going through the brain of either. <laughs> and while he said this many, many years ago, there's been research done recently at MIT by Rosalind Pickard's group that was published in 2010. What she does is she uses technology to monitor the student's brain activity during their normal day-to-day -day activities. The students would write in a journal, and she would monitor where their brain activity spiked and where it flatlined. It shouldn't be surprising to us that while watching TV, students' brain activity is very minimal. But the second aspect of their lives where their brain activity flatlines is lecture class. If you look at this compared to sleep, <laughs> students' brains are much more active when they're sleeping than they are when they're in class. If this isn't solid evidence that we need to reinvent our lecture space, I don't know what is. Why have we not transformed the lecture space? There have been many strategies in order to transform the lecture space, and one of them is a TED Talk given by Sal Khan. He titled it, Let's Use Video to Reinvent Education. I saw this, I was inspired, and I went out and I created over 300 general chemistry lecture videos and posted them online for people all over the world to learn chemistry 24-7. But don't you see a problem here? It's a problem that I, as well as many other people have overlooked when they're using technology in their instruction. We haven't reinvented education, we've just changed the medium. And any time we put together an iTunes U course, a MOOC, or any type of online course, what we're doing is we're combining the two aspects that our students have zero brain activity <laughs> and hoping magically through this marriage that our students are going to learn and be really, really, really engaged. Now, every once in a while, a product can come along that can completely revolutionize everything. Many tech enthusiasts think that this might be the iPad. But it's not the product that can redesign education. It's enthusiastic instruction and strong pedagogy. Back in the 1400s, the product that everyone wanted to get their hands on was called a book. It was the sexy thing to have in education because that's how you got knowledge, and knowledge is power. So what we did is we crammed everybody in an amphitheater space, had an instructor read word for word everything in that book, and have everyone else vigorously scribe down every single word because that was the most effective way to transfer knowledge and cement it in a textbook. 
The printing press could have completely revolutionized this, but instead what we see today is a lecture space that looks something like this. If I were to take a surgeon from the 1500s, transport them through time, take them over to Ohio State's Wexner Medical Center, and ask them to perform surgery, they wouldn't be able to do it. The medical profession has transformed over the years, and a surgeon from the 1500s couldn't execute the proper surgery and use the right instrumentation that we use today. But let's think about this for a second. If I took a chemistry professor from the 1500s and put them into this environment, they'd look around and say, wow, those seats look really comfortable. What's that thing on the ceiling projecting light? And they would walk right down to the chalkboard, pick up a piece of chalk, and teach exactly in the same way that they did in the 1500s. Why have we revolutionized almost every aspect of our lives with the exception of the teaching profession? How can we transform the lecture space? It's very likely that this transformation of the lecture space is going to happen with technology. And we can get advice from a variety of different people of how to execute proper technology use in the classroom. One very unlikely source is a group of people who actually shun technology, the Amish community. I have a unique relationship to the Amish because my grandparents grew up that way. Here's a picture of my grandfather John in his one-room schoolhouse where he learned reading, writing, and arithmetic. And here's a picture of him marrying my grandmother Susie shortly after their wedding. They converted from the Amish church over to the Mennonite church, and while these are a little bit different, they do share a lot of same similarities. They are very simple people. I would go over to my grandparents' house when I was a kid, and I would say, Grandpa, why do you guys not have a TV in your house? It seemed very odd to me. He responded with a simple saying that I heard very often as I was growing up. It's not necessary. It's not necessary is a phrase that we need to think about when we're employing technology into the classroom because we should use it when it's necessary or more importantly, when it's necessary for student learning. A product that I use to utilize technology in my classroom is a program called Learning Catalytics developed by Eric Majeur, who's a physicist from Harvard. He's also done a lot of research in peer instruction technology, and he says that finally the technology caught up with the pedagogy that will allow him to use the product the way it needs to be used in the classroom. So what I'll do is I'll deliver a question just like this to my students. It goes right to their smartphone, their laptop, or their tablet device, and I'll have them individually work on this for a few minutes. I, they'll now insert their answer and be able to have some type of an investment in that answer. Some students reply faster than others, and here's what a typical lecture space would look like, and I can see in real time how my students are answering. So at this point, I can go over and talk to the students who answered B and C and say, hey, one of you are right, one of you are wrong, and then I'll just walk away. They don't like this very much. What, what, what? Nope, figure it out. Because I need to come over and talk to these students and tell them the same thing. One's right and one's wrong. This can help stimulate discussion and brain activity. And as I do a time lapse of what happens in the classroom, I can see all the responses come in. Think pair share is a popular technique that's now being adopted by some educators. And while it has some good points, if we told the students who are sitting over here that all answered C, which is a wrong answer, to pair up with the people sitting next to them, they're not gonna get much out of that conversation. But, what learning cat but wouldn't it be cool if we could take something like this and pair students together and put them in groups of four and have all different answers in that group and have them argue and discuss and debate what that right answer would be? Well, with learning catalytics, I can do that with a touch of a button. And the students on their device get a message telling them which classmates to work with and where they're sitting in the lecture space, whether it be in front of them to the left, behind them to the right, but they know that these groups are formed by the algorithm that allows them to have effective peer instruction. The results from my classroom are absolutely fascinating. This question right here delivered was 53% correct when students individually answered it, and it improved to 96% correct when they worked in groups. And we're finding that students are teaching each other. And if you ask anyone who teaches anything, teaching is the best way to learn a particular subject. 
In my mind, this is a necessary use of technology to facilitate student engagement in the lecture space. Now that we have platforms like this to help deliver problems, we can start to innovate a little bit more. Innovators see things differently, and they're, be able, they're able to take their vision and put it into action. One such innovator in the early 1900s was a man by the name of Edwin Porter, who created a film called The Great Train Robbery. His innovation, taking the camera off the tripod and allowing three different camera angles in his short film. This was completely revolutionary, because instead of just putting a camera on the tripod, which is what we do in a lot of our online courses, he allowed his viewers to see things differently and see things from his perspective. So how can we take this innovation and put it forward into our classroom? So before lecture, I'll give my students a video. And here's a snapshot of one of a magnesium ribbon burning in the presence of oxygen when you light it with a propane torch. I kind of channel my inner Bill Simmons here and take the student responses before class and I'll show responses from my actual students in class when we talk about this topic. Here's an example of one. Design an experiment? Do what? Ugh, this class is going to be hard. Yep, these are my students, is what Bill Simmons would say if he's teaching the class. Another student says, you could look for the formation of a precipitate, which I'm now just learning about because before the video I had no idea what a precipitate was. The textbook referred to these solids as insoluble, but I had no idea that there were actually substances impossible to dissolve. That seems crazy. Chemistry sometimes is crazy. But what's crazy about this comment is that this student on the second day of class read chapter four of the textbook without being prompted or assigned to do so. We need to come up with reasons for our students to read the textbook. Reasons that pique their curiosity so they go seek out this information. And what we can do now is take the camera off the tripod and innovate the way Porter did. Because this reaction of this magnesium ribbon burning in the presence of oxygen isn't some just bright, shining light. And everybody loves the lights and the explosions and the exploding balloons. But what a chemist is seeing is the magnesium and the oxygen atoms rearranging. And what we're seeing is how the magnesium is going to change to magnesium oxide, and it's going to be a chemical change. And when we design an experiment, all we really need to do is weigh these two substances before and after the reaction to figure out what happened here. It's time to transform the lecture space. Learning is about content, curiosity, and relationships. Content is what we as instructors deliver to our students. Curiosity is what our students bring to us. And the relationships are what we bring each other. When you're in innovating with technology in your classroom, don't use it just for technology's sake. Use it the way Bill Simmons does, to pique the curiosity of his learners. Use it the way the Amish would when it's only necessary. Use it the way Edwin Porter would to allow our students to see things differently. Because in the end, we're doing more than transforming the classroom. We are transforming students' lives. I may not ever make it on Bill Simmons' mailbag or ever receive an email from him, but I do oftentimes receive emails from some of my former students talking about the accomplishments that they've made in their life. And when I read them, I can sit back, I can smile and say, yup, these are my students.